I am Jim Collison, and live from our virtual studios around the world, this is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on April 15th, 2021. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches, share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our live chat room, and the link is above me on the live page right there, or uh, and it'll take you to YouTube. Sign in and chat with us as we're going along. If you have questions after the fact, and many of you are doing this now, send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to subscribe if you're on YouTube. That way you get notifications of whenever we publish anything new. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. I think uh, podcasting actually got more popular during the pandemic. And so if you haven't caught up on that yet, uh, jump in there and get subscribed to Called the Coach. Dr. Jacqueline Robinson is our host today. She works as a learning and development consultant here with me at Gallup. And Jacqueline, it's always a great day when I have you on Called the Coach. Welcome back. Likewise. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm excited to announce who we have on board today. We've got Jane Miller. Uh, it, she is responsible for creating a high-performing culture that drives customer experience, employee engagement, and financial outcomes for sustainable growth. If you don't know, as President and Chief Operating Officer of Gallup, Jane oversees the worldwide operations. Uh, she ensures all systems, resources, and most importantly, people are in place and align to achieve the goals of the organization. Uh, Jane is steadfast in her focus to create a sustainable future as a socially responsible, community-focused organization that maximizes human potential. So we're very excited to have Jane on board today. Um, her top five are self-assurance, individualization, belief, focus, and maximizer. So welcome, Jane. So excited to have you. Thank you, Jacqueline. It's great to be here. It's been quite a while, so I'm excited to be back. Yes. Jane, you're, uh, we had you on for belief, I think season yes. uh, two or three yeah. or early on called to coach and that, uh, or on theme Thursday, it was one of my favorite, uh, times. So it's always, always great to have you as a part of this. When Jacqueline and I were brainstorming on this idea, you know, we're, we're calling this common, you know, sharing a common purpose. Yeah. You're, you were the first person in my eyesight. We got to get Jane here to talk about this. When, when we think about teams and culture and values and purpose, all those things. Certainly your, uh, your primary responsible, uh, responsibilities at Gallup for what you do for us is to bring all of those. Mm -hmm. And you just don't say it, you, you, you kind of, you do it, like you do it and you do it well. Um, it'd be easy to, for me to say that, of course, because I work for the organization and so does Jacqueline. But I think Lots of folks have seen you live this out over the years. I mean, you've been a Gallup forever, mm -hmm. I, probably more <laughs> years than you've been alive, just to yeah. be honest. Right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, give this for <laughs> folks who don't know, just really quick uh, before we di dive into the content. Can you go back a little bit on your history at Gallup, just uh, fr from, a, from an organizational standpoint, uh, g give us a, a two-minute background on you and, and your, your run up there at Gallup? Um, to your point, I've literally grown up here. Um, and as a privately held employee-owned organization, I think it's always a little bit different than one that may be um, publicly held. But many of us have been here our entire career um, and have really been here because of the purpose, because of the belief, and because of all that we contribute to society. So um, I've been in many different jobs over the past 35 years and um, continue to have um, a significant amount of fun and passion and mission for everything we do on a daily basis throughout this entire global organization. That's great. Jacqueline and I have been spending a lot of time talking about leaders and uh, just coming off a leadership series. We know, we really know, and I think we've, we've figured this out during COVID that um, uh, building a strengths-based organization is really kind of puts a protective bubble or, or, or mm -hmm. puts a, uh, maybe bubble's the wrong word. Let's use armor <laughs> around organizations, right? When we think about teams and leadership, Jane, as we think about the lead up to COVID, we're going to talk about the the past, the present, and the future uh, during our time here. But as you think about the lead up to COVID, so everything pre-March uh, 2020, and we think about the culture we've built here, um, highlight for us kind of the importance as we think about that culture for you and the values that settle in. How important, how do you see that and how important that is, is that to our teams at Gallup? 
Well, I think it's integral. And I think that we were very fortunate that we had a strong culture going in because it naturally builds an additional um, level of resiliency in individuals and in teams and ultimately in the organization to make it through pretty rough times where there was a lot of fear, a lot of unknowns. And by having a close culture um, where people could rely upon their strengths, be open about their weaknesses, be transparent, it really allowed a different level of collaboration and ultimately performance that people could rally behind each other, rally behind the purpose, the mission, and everything that our clients needed, the market needed, um, and figure out a way to really a path forward, a path mm -hmm. out of um, what were some pretty dark times as an organization. In that, when when we think about the armor built, the pre-armor, getting ready for this, and, and we think about um, you know, culture and values, if there was one thing you could point to, and, and you could do two if you need to, but if there was one thing you look back and say, man, I am glad that we got that right. What was that? And then how did we get there? Like, so maybe a two prong question. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, hmm. you know, I think that really what it came down to was, um, and probe me on this a little bit, but I think it was the overcommunication. So mm -hmm. again, we, a few of us began to see this unfold as early as January. And part of that was because we were sitting in Omaha and Omaha was one of the only, I think it's called biocontainment unit, units in the country. So we started getting COVID patients long before the rest of the country was even aware from a media perspective and could begin to see. In addition, we saw what was occurring in China. Therefore, we could mentally prepare using basically strategic to say, we don't know what's coming, but we know something's coming. So let's start over communicating. Um, our research showed early on that over communication through managers so that managers could truly relate to each person at a different level and meet them where they were because everybody was experiencing the same storm, but they literally weren't in the same boat. I know that that's a popular quote and I absolutely love it. And strengths really helped each manager think about where each person was in each of those boats to help make sense of the experience that was beginning to occur, whether it was emotionally, psychologically, or whether it was financially. Some all of a sudden didn't have jobs because the world changed. Um, others were busier than they've ever been and more productive than they'd ever been. So managers really had to navigate you know, who was having waves crashing up over them and who was smooth sailing. And I think that um, the communication was an integral value as a part of our culture to say, we're in it together. Now let's figure out how each person contributes to what it means in coming out of it. Jacqueline, you've yeah. you've watched this transpire too from the outside. Anything, anything you'd add to that, filtering it through kind of what we saw from a customer standpoint as well? Yeah, that lands so well. Um, and it, it goes right back to that communication point that you just brought up, Jane. I think we saw that even as employees at Gallup that we were receiving frequent communication by emails and through town halls. And so we always felt like we, uh, like it was very transparent and we knew it was coming down the pipeline. And then at the kind of the frontline level, as we were coaching and working with other managers, I think those that over communicated, uh, they found that it was easier to start navigating through those those rough waters and that the team was still very cohesive, but those that weren't communicating or leadership wasn't maybe communicating with them really struggled. So I think you're hitting the nail on the head in terms of were they already a strengths-based organization beforehand where they were connected to the mission and they understood and appreciated each other's talents, but then were they communicating um, as soon as things started to, to get a little gray or it was, okay, what's coming down the pipeline? So I think even at Gallup, if we didn't know what we didn't know, there was still almost a plan in place to say, okay, uh, if we don't know what we don't know, if we go this way, this is what will happen. If we go this way, this is what will happen. And I think we did that so well. And I recognize that other organizations, um, the managers or leaders I was coaching, it was either or, you know, they either mm -hmm. over communicated or they really struggled with the communication piece. And it felt like a lot of kind of lost souls, so to speak, within the organization that were saying, where are we going? Where are we heading? What's our purpose? Um, how am I contributing? Jane, you want to add anything to that? Well, I was just going to chime in because I think we're, you know, culture and purpose are closely linked, but they're very, very different. Mm -hmm. And I think purpose is actually a subset of culture, but you can't have culture without purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I think when people joined 
Gallup in particular, um, and any of the other exceptional organizations, and there are so many that we work with, um, they choose in many cases because of what the purpose and the mission is. But what then has to happen with culture is how it plays out in daily communication, how mm -hmm. it plays out in daily actions, really. Um, because culture at the end of the day is how we do what we do and why we do what we do. And that is demonstrated through management and leadership. And then how individual associates and individual contributors are able to make decisions on their own on a daily basis that allow them the empowerment and the encouragement to know the right answer. And I think that that was one of the beauties is that it, it continued to reinforce and affirm what people needed to do as it related to really their own values and their own strengths so that they could carry on throughout um, throughout the entire pandemic. Mm -hmm. Jane, how important, you know, you know, two years ago, we started, we wrote a book, it's the manager. And we, we've known, I think we've known that I've sensed that being a manager at Gallup for the 14 years that I've been there. I've certainly sensed we, we kind of always knew that we wrote the book around and been talking a lot about it, but going into the pandemic now, as we think about the, the actual, it's now March, 2020, we're headed in, how important was it for, and what did you see in our managers or in managers around this purpose in their response to this. So give us a little critique of what you saw from the outside <clears throat> looking in and how managers uh, responded. You know, it was clearly to me the most important group to get to immediately and to stay in touch with immediately. So I made a point of making sure that every other week I was with almost every single management team throughout the organization to say, is there anything you need? Do you understand where we're at? And we were overtly open about where our challenges were, what we could see, what we couldn't see, and essentially created a 12-step plan to say, here's how we will move through this and progress um, until we know exactly where the revenue and the business is coming from. But I think it was a way to develop first transparency and then trust that allowed them to feel like they could say what they needed to say in their own words. Because I think if you have too many canned statements that comes out from leadership, it doesn't have the sincerity or the stamp of each of the managers. And each of the managers are really running their own little teams and their own little businesses and need to feel like they can translate it in their own words and have confidence that it's going to stick. And so I think that that was one of the most important things was really helping managers, again, make sense of experience of where we were and what we had to do and that we had hard decisions in front of us. You know, I read an article um, a few weeks ago that a lot of people don't talk about the most difficult part of management is having difficult conversations and then letting people go. And in the middle of a pandemic, there was a lot of that. And so they really had to go through um, and understand and have the competency to have the confidence while most importantly being super caring. And I think that that was maybe one of the best things is it really showed everybody's care. And that's a critical part of our high performing culture is that we're also a high caring culture. And I think that came out in spades throughout all the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How important you, you re referenced that 12 step plan. And, and when it first came out, I was, I, I didn't, I didn't realize how important that was going to be, but from a senior management perspective, how was, how important was that, that you had it kind of already pre-planned out and we could track and follow it as we went along. There were no surprises. <laughs> yeah, it created right? a lot of stability, a lot <laughs> okay. of stability. Well, that's funny that you say no surprises because I have Adaptability 33. So basically, I don't like surprises. Um, I want to make sure that we kind of know what's always coming. And with strategic number six, it means that I have to have a backup plan for a backup plan for a backup plan. Well, because we didn't know what was happening with the economy, we didn't know what was going to happen with our business, we had to keep saying, okay, what happens if this occurs? What happens if this occurs? And what happens if this occurs? And then make three to 10 literally different plans. So then that's what constituted the 12-step plan. And I think it's always better for humans to say, here's what we can all be fearful of together. Here's some things that you don't need mm -hmm. to be fearful of so that we just, you know, draw a line in the sand and say, yeah, there are some scary things in front of us. Let's own that and we'll be in it together. And then here are the things that we shouldn't be scared of. Here are the things we can just knock out right now. So really it was a way to, again, have the transparency. I love everything about business. I love everything about leading a business as it relates to, again, our purpose and mission um, or our why for why we exist as an organization. But at the end of the day, you still have all the mechanics that go into a business. And first and foremost, you've got to take care of your best resource, which is your people. So the 12-step plan was intended to make sure that our people knew where we were in this journey, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, really, and how they fit into it and how they could help um, play a role in getting us all through it. 
And that was, I think that was what made it um, valuable was it gave people a roadmap. Jane, how did your own top five play into it to that? As we thought, you know, you, you alluded to a little bit, a little bit, but it's March. You're, you're thinking I've got to lead through this, by the way, I never had any doubt uh, from, well, from the outside. Like I was, you know, <laughs> yes, I, but, boy. but talk about it from your own perspective, from your own top five. How did you, what'd you lean on? How'd well, I, I sometimes say self-assurance is one of the most misunderstood strengths. And um, I think some of you have heard me tell the story before that I didn't even believe I had self-assurance when it first came out in 1999. I went running over and said, there's no way I have this. And um, Don said to me, dad said to me, um, do you know um, what you do well? And do you know what you don't do well? And I said, I do. He goes, do you know what your weaknesses are? I said, yeah. And he said, can you let go of things and let other people be better than you? And I said, absolutely. Well, that was the epitome of self-assurance in this case, because in leading with self-assurance, nobody, myself included, knew what was coming. We didn't know what the next day was going to hold, let alone the next week. So you have to have that inner compass, um, that true north, and that's a part of belief as well, combined with self-assurance, that says we're just going to start moving, and through relationships and each of the different leaders, let's talk about how we're going to do this. Um, obviously, it wasn't all, you know, cupcakes and roses. It was clearly having some tough conversations about what part of our business needed to change in order to continue down this journey. So self-assurance really said, who are the people I need to help me? What are my weaknesses so I can get other people to help me fast? And pulling those people together. And then the belief in the purpose and the mission that we have so much to offer clients. We knew that clients were going to need us more than ever through this, whether it meant that it was maybe not in April, but, but for sure by May and June. And they did. Clients hung in there. They were back big, especially by June and July, and really needed to know what was happening with the future of work. Also, simultaneously, what was happening as we were going through it, um, really in helping create exceptional workplaces in a very, very unprecedented, of course, the most popular word of the year, um, time. So self-assurance and strategic, but really with that core belief um, right in the middle of all of it. William has a question in chat. And I, I, Jacqueline, I want to throw this to you as well, but let's ask Jane first. So William says he's curious, did you meet with manager teams as individual groups or as large groups? Did you feel like your communication would be better or worse either way? It's uh, an Jane? excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, I did both. So I literally went through, I would say we have about 12 very large groups of 80 to 200 people um, each. And then I went through with each of their management teams. So five to 12 people at a time with their um, leader and just answered any questions because what was going on in technology was very different than what was going on within administrative support, for example, or what was going on within accounting versus consulting. So the differences across the business were great. And if you didn't have the individual meetings, individualization is number two. And sometimes I, my individualization comes out more in systems and processes in how it affects people. So I segment the groups to think about what's most meaningful and relevant to each of those groups mm -hmm. so that we have clear cut communication. But simultaneously, we would have the large group of managers together as well so they could hear some of the common general messages to know that they were all getting the same message at one level, the most important messages, and then how it was individualized by team based on where their business was. Jacqueline, have you heard yeah. anything as in your coaching work with our organizations? Have you have you heard any best practices around that? This in this communicating with teams individually, large groups. Have you heard anything? I have, and I, I would say that has been the best practice. Exactly what um, Jane just expressed that I've seen in organizations as well, where they're they're talking at the more broader scale, and then. From that level, the managers um, are taking it down to the teams and, and really being clear on this is what's happening across the board. This is how it impacts us. And let's talk about, let me open this, the, the floor to you now and get your feedback. What are you still concerned about? What questions do you have? Um, you know, do you understand where your value is and how you're continuing to contribute? Because I think that question arose a lot for people as we were at that the ground level in learning and development is hearing from people. Am I still offering value? Am I still contributing? Am I connected to the the ultimate purpose of the organization? Has our purpose shifted because of what's happening in the world right now? Um, especially with people working remote, you're not always on site. So people don't know if you're contributing value or not. And I think the more 
clarity that managers had from leadership and then take the, the managers having the clarity to then bring that to the individual contributors um, was a game changer for a lot to go, okay, now I know the, I, I know our purpose still remains clear. I know how I contribute to that. This is the value that I bring. And I think people want to see what messaging is in common for the entire organization, mm -hmm. what messaging is in common for their team or segment of the business. And then they still want to know, but what's in it for me and what matters for me? And am mm -hmm. I okay to your point? So it's, it's, it's as if we've got to move between at least three to four levels of types of communication to gain the transparency and then ultimately the trust. Mm -hmm. Jane, two questions in one here. Uh, Lisa asked, who was involved uh, in developing this 12-step plan? Not to be confused with the other 12-step plan, by the way. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't even know there was, but yeah, I heard that. I heard that afterwards. It sounds like uh, Jane Strategic knows how to do it, but what other groups provided. And then I, and then I want to ask you the question, how did you feel? So we, we, we put this together and that communication goes downstream, right? It, it gets communicated uh, out. Do you feel like there it was coming back to you as well? Were you getting the right amount of input you needed back during that communication cycle? Let me start it, with that yeah. because that's, that's a great question. It's an excellent uh -huh. question. And <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people don't realize, but leaders need feedback, good, bad, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. I wanted it all and I got it all. And um, better than ever. And I um, appreciated it immensely. As a matter of fact, I started saving it all um, because I think it was so evident of both either, you know, affirmation or in some cases fear, not really, there wasn't, there was a little bit of anger in some cases, but not much. Um, but I, I was getting great feedback. Not only do I elicit it and ask for it because I believe in opinions counting. Um, and I've, I'm very open about, I want to hear if you're not okay with it too. So yes, people would write back uh, like crazy to say, thank you for this communication or, but what about this? So it was huge. And I wish it was I wish that happened more often, by the way. So that was good. Um, let's see. The 12-step plan, really, I'm going to, it It was a management committee effort, um, which meant that each of the people who were responsible for different areas were always putting their input in. But from a business perspective, the CFO and I really, um, Jim Krieger and I, needed to sit down and begin to structure it as it related to where the business was growing and where it was not growing. And then go back and forth with collaboration as to how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? With a group that was about mm, at least 12 to 14 and then would expand to about 25. And then we would expand it to all of the managers, which were over 100. So it was kind of an accordion effect, in and out. Um, and and so, you, yeah. did, you did feel like you were getting the what you needed uh, you were getting that feedback that you needed to be able to then make the next set of decisions. Oh, yeah, because it was, you know, I always say conflict causes clarity. And one of the beauties is with best friends at work, we are very open with each other. And so we can mm -hmm. say some, you know, there are times where people are like, but I, I can't cut that many people. So-and-so has to cut that many people. And I said, their business isn't shrinking as much as your business is shrinking um, or their business is growing. We've got to make sure that we've got the right talent in this area. So there were some really tough conversations that were emotionally hard, but because we have the um, long-term relationships and the in-depth relationships, we can say some hard things and um, patch up and keep going relative to getting underneath what that discussion needs to be. Did, did you ever feel like that communication was forced or was out of the ordinary or had the culture work we had done in the organization prior to COVID just lead to that natural accordion of communication back and forth? Um, yes and no. So I would say never waste a crisis. So I think it became an opportunity that, you know, sometimes, and I, I heard this from several leaders, actually, and there are many articles on it as well, that you don't, it's a little bit like a pilot, that they're flying on autopilot and doing everything as well as they possibly can 95, 98% of the time. But you sure want to make sure that if the plane starts to go awry, you've got a great pilot, you know, two to 5% or pilot in that two to 5% time. Well, the same thing happened with COVID with leadership is that people really had an opportunity to step up in a way that they wouldn't normally have without a crisis. So the crisis actually showcased more and more great leaders, great managers throughout the entire, I think, world, right? All of a sudden, mm -hmm. we saw people we never saw as leaders throughout the world that were really able to maneuver at a whole new level. I think that was very, very cool for leadership. Um, on the other hand, it, it means that um, hopefully they'll have other ways to showcase that when it's not a crisis. Mm -hmm. 
uh, stress testing is, yes, is really what yes. happened, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. These, these got stress tested, Jacqueline, in, in the work that you're doing. Were you getting that sense that organizations were really being stress tested and some were doing maybe better than others? And Jane, I'm going to ask you for some examples as we move yeah. forward here in a second. But Jacqueline, are you were you feeling that as you're out there with other organizations? Yes, I think um, I'd say for the most part, many did see that obstacle as an opportunity because more innovation ended up happening. There's a lot of creativity of how do we shift gears and do things differently, um, especially in going back to what we talked about initially when we, we, you know, kicked it off today, if they already had a strengths based culture or a solid culture of communication, um, trust, relationships and partnerships where you could feel free to communicate your fear or your paranoia or I'm burned out or I'm overwhelmed. Um, if they had that foundation first, then they were able to man- maneuver so much more efficiently through this. But we all saw even in our research that engagement ended up increasing because um, what, whether you had that communication initially or not, COVID forced it and leaders were kicking into high gear and they were over communicating. Um, that was know, March, April, said. May. It was yeah. amazing to see that. Yeah. And then I think we saw a little bit of a decline because the communication kind of trickled off and maybe we contribute some of that to, are we opening up? Are we not opening up? But then um, it just, increased again to go up. Oh, okay. We've got to, we've got to kick this back into high gear. So I think across the board, it's done the one, gone up. maybe a positive. Yeah. That's happened for overall COVID is communications increased huge. You know, the only thing that we saw yeah. that's, that's not great is of course that well being and engagement mm-hmm. used to have a linear relationship and now they're going the opposite direction. So, um, companies have a huge opportunity in front of them to really change the trajectory of individuals well-being and overall their company well-being. Um, because that's not working for a lot of people, which is a little, um, uh, we, we have yet to explain what's exactly going on because people are more engaged. Work is a respite mm-hmm. for many people, right? Because they're loving the productivity. They're loving the focus um, and all the things that are, that are working very, very well because so many companies are having so much success. Um, on the flip side, though, that well-being is leading the lack of well-being to the stress, the burnout, the worry that still has to be managed. <sighs> or we won't end up with Mm -hmm. the strength of humans that we need. We need them to use their strengths so they get that strength back, right? Yes. I'm glad you brought that up. There's an article I was just reading, and they're they're coining vacations now as workcations because people are still working on vacation. So they're still engaged. They want to keep doing what they're doing, but they're not taking that mental respite um, or spiritual respite that they need to just take a moment, take a pause, refresh themselves and get back to work. So I think that's where it goes back even to our friendships and partnerships in the workplace to say, take this meaningful experience for yourself. Take that pause. We've got you covered. We have your back. Uh, Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see what ends up happening down the pipeline. You know, it's anybody's guess moving forward. So now we're really back to where we were a year ago in a very different way, in a positive (laughs) way. But um, I'm calling it the great global work experiment because some people, some companies are enforcing you will be back in the office five days a week. Others are saying you don't ever have to show in the office again, but it appears the majority are saying for those who can in, in knowledge workers and uh, white collar workers that um, there'll be a hybrid work schedule where you need to show some days, but you can stay home some days. And it's really anybody's guess as it relates to, you know, I think some of us believe that there's no doubt that when you have the relationships, it creates the innovation, it creates um, uh, some of the um, additional intrinsic parts of work that are so important when you are present in the office. But what is the right amount of time to be present that matters relative to the ultimate productivity? Nobody knows. That's everybody's guess. Mm -hmm. Um, Some companies are saying you've got to live within driving distance of a hub. Others are saying you can migrate anywhere, excuse me, in the world or anywhere in the country. That begins to change what's going to happen to compensation in the U.S. primarily, maybe globally, um, because all of a sudden those who are flocking to small towns, um, according to one of our polls, 48% of Americans wanted to move to rural America. Well, rural America is also small mountain towns, and it's just completely changing the dynamics from an economic perspective, from housing to jobs to cost of living overnight. So the next two years are going to be fascinating to watch in terms of how all this plays out. Jane, uh, great, a great question around us from the chat room. What would you say to an organization that did not communicate well at the start of the pandemic? And let's just say things didn't go well, <laughs> like whether it's communication or whatever. Um, and, and there's maybe some distrust 
what would you say as we, you know, in your leadership, what would you say to coaches who may be helping these organizations or organizational leaders who might be listening to this? Is it too late? No, well, it's not too late. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really, they can start at any point. And again, I believe it starts with the manager. It is the manager. And leaders need to have those open conversations and bring managers together to talk about where some of the perceptions are, the obstacles are, the realities, and then go out and communicate and open up and, you know, have some of those realities exposed and talk openly about how we resolve them and how we move forward. Um, of course, at the base of it is always thinking about how each individual plays into that bigger picture and how the managers bring people together for the greater good. Um, I think that'll be one of the challenges moving to the future, too, is that when we work from home, we may be individually more productive, but are we collectively? So we have to say, are we doing what's best for the greater good when we're remote um, versus when we are together? Because when we're together, we can do some pretty powerful things. Jane, have you learned anything personally on communication during this time now that we're so different? I mean, we're, we're different, right? We, we all went, we're kind of this we're kind of in that hybrid spot now, sort of, we're probably still more home. Was there anything you changed personally about your communication over the course of the year, knowing that not everybody's on campus or, you know, <laughs> well, do I don't have communication in my top 10, so I can't just ramble on anything, believe it or not. Maybe I am right now because it's a hot button, but um, I, I've learned to rely upon a lot of other people for example, we put a survey out this week to say, what other communication do you want or need right now? Because there's a time and a place when you think you've said it all, and yet there's somebody or several in the organization who feel like they need more information. And there's others who feel flooded, like they're drinking from a fire hose and don't give me any more information. So it really is, um, my change has been, again, I almost become, um, oh, because of my individualization, I'm like, are we giving enough? Are we giving too much? And I'm always trying to balance that. And I think sometimes I drive them crazy because I'm, um, trying to get to the bottom of what everybody needs, and we can't possibly solve that, but we can get closer to it by saying what information will help you do your job better, what information will help you get more information to clients, um, or be better with clients, what information will help you be more productive. So it's just a matter of asking even more than we used to. Yeah, I love that you keep hearing the theme of um, communication and feedback, welcoming feedback as a leader. Oh, huge. And that's yeah. something that and that goes back to, to having trust in your team and having trust within the organization. Some things that we sometimes see and in, in work with organizations on is, are you, as a leader, are you allowing managers to provide feedback to you and, and share out their thoughts, the, the team's concerns and thoughts and, and get the feedback so that it's not just sitting at the top, but we're making sure that we're hearing what's coming from the bottom too. So I wanted to call that out because I think that's, that's key in an organization. It's that feedback for sure. chain. For sure. Uh, Jane, when we think about, you know, a common purpose, we think, I think about best friends at work. And Diane asked this great question. Is there a concern that if people are working more hybrid, uh, will, will they have the, av the availability or the ability to develop best friends at work without that person there, you know, without it being in person? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think it's much more difficult, especially for those who are brand new to the organization, um, to really form a bond just over Zoom or just over Teams or just over WebEx. Whereas if you've been around 10 years or mm -hmm. 14 years or 20 years, you have those best friends that you'll make sure that you have an intentional contact and relationship with, whether you're hybrid, whether you're remote. Um, but it is more difficult. I think we've all found that it's more difficult in the last year um, to stay in touch. It's a different kind of, we're all tired of Zoom happy hours. We can't wait to get back mm -hmm. to the, to the regular ones or in-person meetings. So I, you can, you can do it over Zoom. It just takes, it's just more difficult. It's more fun in person, right? I don't, I don't know, to be honest. Oh. <laughs> like, and, listen, and I'm the, coming I'm, from the woo too. I'm the woo guy, right? <laughs> and, and, but, but I have transitioned. I really have enjoyed because I can do a happy hour, a happy hour with anybody in the world. That's true. At any time. Yes. And it, like it has, it has actually opened up a world of, of, uh, I was, I was scheduled to meet with a happy hour with a Gallup employee right at the beginning of the pandemic. And we moved it virtual and we have met every Friday during the pandemic because of that. That's cool. And have fostered a really great relationship. Right. And so mm -hmm. 
I, I don't know if I'm willing. Like, I, well, listen, but okay, I, but that's your woo yeah. in action. And right, so you've right. been very intentional about it. And I think that that's where the trick will become is for those who aren't as natural at it, yeah. um, it's going to be even more difficult. Um, and of course, there are people who, to your point, woo or no woo, have found a contentment in being home, either because they are more productive or because it just it's a safety zone as well um, for lots of reasons. So Again, it's a big old experiment that we're just going to have to see how this yeah. whole thing unfolds. But we have seen a dip in some best friends at work, team by team. And I'm not quite sure where it is in the global database. We'll have to look that up. But um, I think that will be one of them that will be challenging. Jane, can you think of, uh, and this is George's question, a specific example of maybe exceptional teamwork as you think about the last year? What, what Do you have a story you could tell us just I from do. your point of view? Um, I wish I could go a little bit deeper on it, but I think the thing that surprised me the most was how we did not miss a deadline. We did not miss a beat. Once everybody was told on the 13th, go home, take your laptops, and everybody's going to start working from home, you know, one of the, there were so many um, critics out there in general uh, across the world that would say, well, how do you know people are productive enough? Well, because they're meeting deadlines, because they're not only getting all the work done that was planned, but they're going above and beyond and able to do extra things. So one would be our technology team of 200 people continued to push out every single feature and function and launch that they had planned on time or, or in advance. Then the other one was we had a group um, of about 20 people come together and do COVID research. That was just miraculous. Um, they came together and said, we're going to figure out how we research everything under the sun and get different articles out and begin to get to clients as fast as we can with what's going on in current work and in future of work. And it worked absolutely beautifully. Um, so there was all kinds of really cool opportunities. We also went virtual with all of our classes. Maybe many of you know that. So we were all in person around the globe and we all looked at each other and went, oh my God, what are we going to do if we don't have classes? And we instantly moved them. Thanks to Jim, thanks to Benjamin, um, yeah. Jacqueline, there were so many involved. We saw China do it with just one little brief class and we said, we're going to take that whole thing and run with it. And thankfully we did and it's worked beautifully. So there's tons of examples that just make it so cool. I felt like we got hyper focused. Like we you, did. You, you mentioned earlier, you know, yes. don't don't let any good. Um, how did you say that? Some, never waste a crisis. Never waste a crisis. Yeah, I'm gonna take um, that one. That that created a hyper focus. That uh, like we saw in the engagement numbers, Jim Harder, who we had on uh, on a session later or early this year, had said, you know, there's a rallying effect to that. Yes. To mm -hmm. to to engagement, and it kind of wanes on the end. Jane, how do we keep? that focus. Like, you know, I, I'm afraid we're going to return back to a, a hybrid world that will only be as good as like as hybrid is, right? And and that we lose some of that focus. As we think about creating purpose, what are you thinking about in the next year of keeping that focus intact? Well, if you've got a couple hours, focus is number four for me. And many times I say it's just tied for number one. If I would have guessed, I would have said it was actually number one. Um, and in the last 24 hours, I've been dealing with that a lot, actually, because I'm beginning to see it a little bit. And I want to continue to beat the focus drum stronger than ever, that we don't get um, out of our guardrails or out of our lanes and become all things to all people. It's really important we continue to do what we do best individually with our strengths and our teams, but also as an organization. So I do think organizations have to continue to say, what are our strengths? Um, what are our weaknesses? What are our opportunities? And what are our threat? And what are our threats? And continue to move that focus ball forward. Um, and maybe now is just a time because we're in kind of almost that in between where everybody's going to be vaccinated soon, and everybody's wondering what's next. What's next? Well, yes. we're going to continue on the same path and figure out what we can add in and maybe what we take away. But focus is absolutely critical. So it's kind of the next unknown, the next door we've got to open and say, stay the path. Jacqueline, how would you consult on that? Yeah. I was just thinking. Great question. I, I love the response too. And I think as, as we coach leaders, if they lack that focus um, or clarity, who do they have around them? Going back to powerful partnerships, who's on board that can help support them and, and lean in? And um, maybe they see a vision, but they don't quite know how to frame it up or put it in words. So who's around them that can help them? put some milestones in place so that that bullseye is there. And it's very clear, um, not just in the, the leader's head, if they're visual, but to everybody across the board, uh, mes that messaging gets out. Maybe you and I uh, should talk this afternoon. 
I love high focus, uh, maximizer focus in my <gasps> top 10. So that lean thinking is everything to me. But I think that's what that's what employees are looking for right now too. And, and management's looking for to deliver to employees is what's coming next. Yes, for um, sure. So that clarity is key. And if a leader feels like they're, they're, you know, wobbling and, and they have a, a number of different ideas. How do we really, really frame that up and make sure that we've got one focal point? And who do you need around you to help support you if that's the case? And that was perfectly said. I think that's one of the challenges because I think I see it. But when I know others don't, um, you've got to get past the, so are we disagreeing? Are we not understanding? Or how do we, how do we create the commonality and either agree to disagree or figure out where that focus lies? So, it's a, mm -hmm. It'll be a challenge. Uh, early in the pandemic, uh, my manager, Matt Mosser, uh, pulled me aside and said, look, we're not recruiting anymore. And you guys oh. know half of my job had been recruiting, <laughs> right? We had done a lot, of, a lot of programs around that. And it allowed me to really kind of hyper-focus on, on our webcast infrastructure. And we ended up, I mean, it, it just it's a worked great out story. really, really well to be able to create this content in a way. But I don't have, you guys have this, but I don't have that focus. Like I'm... I am. I have high ranger and high adaptability, and so I can be all over the place. Mm. I I learned, and this is where I don't I don't want to lose this in the pandemic. That I really had to lean on other people. Like I really had to borrow. Uh, you know, in, in this case, I had to borrow Jacqueline's focus to get the first quarter of these things done. Right? They don't just magically mm -hmm. happen. It takes someone being responsible for it, and so leaning into that, leaning into that focus and that responsibility. Jane, um, the executive team and the management team at Gallup was, I think, did a great job of bringing that focus on a very regular basis to mm -hmm. us in, in keeping it. And I and I would love, I mean, I we got two or three years of recovery ahead <laughs> on this, and we're not out of the woods, right? We've got some work to do. As you think about our coaches, and just in the final minutes, kind of before we wrap this up, if you were to give our coaches some advice, Jane, on how they co going into these organizations are working with leaders right now. How do we help them keep that focus? How do we push this recovery forward? What kind of advice would you give them? I think it really does come back to, um, you know, when I think about exceptional workplaces, it's all, it all revolves around literally it's the manager strengths, mm -hmm. engagement and well being. And how do they work with leadership and or with managers in thinking holistically about what each person needs to do and bring to the table to develop their potential and have the greatest possible performance that multiplies so that the managers are multipliers that really leads up to the best company performance for the market and for the clients. Um, and the more that they can work with leaders and managers on thinking about what it takes to bring out the best in every single person while simultaneously meeting the needs of the market and the clients, um, that's really what's going to bring focus to the future, I think. That's so well said. Oh my gosh. And then just thinking about um, the the managers, one thing that comes to mind as you were mentioning that is sometimes they might get stuck in their minds because they're hearing the communication from leadership and you can get so lost in the day to day that you assume everyone already knows and you forget that your team might not have that information. And so it gets stuck at this middle level. So going back to it's the manager, um, I think having and holding managers accountable to communicating or as coaches, if we're reminding them, you know, this is something you're familiar with, you see it every day, but that messaging and communication, remember, might not have been trickled down to your individual contributors, to your team. So communicate, communicate, communicate <laughs> with your team to make sure they know what you and the leaders know. And one more thing on that, sometimes, and this is what I'm learning, is sometimes it's just anything. Like it mm -hmm. might even be, how are you today? It might be a joke for the day. It yeah. might be something, you know, non-work oriented, just so that they know you're out there in cyberspace on Zoom mm -hmm. or on Teams, whether you're in the office or at home or wherever you're working from, just let them know you're thinking about them. Let them know you're alive. Let them know that you know, you care about what they need, any of those kinds of things. I love that. And that goes right back to the question earlier. What do you do if there's distrust in the organization? Those are perfect examples of how to slowly rebuild the trust as the manager continues to just check in authentically with the employees. Uh, Jacqueline, why don't you take a second and uh, thank Jane for coming today. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This was great. Um, you were just the, the the perfect person to have on board. So we are so happy we were able to acquire some of your time today. Well, thank yeah. you guys. It was very, very, very rewarding and fun. 
I love and talking you, about this. Jane, I'll say, you say you have a low adaptability, but we kind of last minute asked you to do this and you were like, yes, I'll clear my calendar. I'll, I'll schedule this. <laughs> yeah. So even though you say you have low adaptability, you, you, uh, you, you made I make it work through, strate through strategic somehow. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, I, I, we, we appreciate it. And, and let me just say thanks for mm -hmm. your leadership and your guidance. It's not just you at Gallup that's doing this. There's a whole team of leaders that are doing this as well, but certainly you're the face of that for mm -hmm. us. And, uh, and we appreciate your, like, I, I, I don't feel like you even skipped a beat. You're as I know. optimistic and as energized. Like, I don't like you went through a, a 15 round boxing match. <laughs> yeah. And, and it all came you're... through as hopeful, oh. stable, <laughs> compassionate. Look like it. Yeah. yeah. You, you, oh, well, I got a few extra little <laughs> here. Well, we, we appreciate it. You carried uh, us through well. We oh, appreciate well, it. Thank, so thank you guys. Thanks for your thanks for your leadership. And and maybe, oh. you know, a year from now we'll follow up with you and say, hey, now that we know we've been doing a lot of those here on Call the Coach, uh, now that we know. So thanks for coming on. Uh, you guys hang tight for me one second. Let me do some reminders. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available now in Gallup Access. And we continue to build out resources that are available to you there. That just gets better. Uh, Jane, to your point, quietly, while everyone was worried about a pandemic, our tech team made access pretty oh, great. Yes. So, yeah. So. If you haven't Amazing. checked it out, if you haven't checked it out in a while, head out to gallup.com slash Clifton Strengths and sign in. And there's all kinds of great stuff available for you there. If you're interested in coaching, master coaching, or you want to, you want to become a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. We'll get you set up on that uh, as well. Don't forget the Gallup at Work Summit is coming up June 8th and 9th. And by the way, they just announced last week, if you sign up, we're going to send you a little swag box, a physical. And it's cool. A physical swag box, no matter where you are in the world. I saw it yesterday. It's really cool. <laughs> Super cool. It's going to have the new well-being book in it. So if you, if you were thinking like, oh, I need to get that book, join us for the summit and you'll get the book in advance uh, mm -hmm. of that coming out. So uh, June 8th and 9th, gallop at work.com. We'd love to see you there. If you want to find us on social, and there's a lot of great things going on on social right now, if you want to stay up to date on everything, just search Clifton Strengths there. We want to thank you for listening to us today. If you're listening live, we won't do a post show. Thanks for coming out. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. <laughs>